Okay, guys, you know what you need to do. You need to like, tag, send the information to everybody you can because you're in for a treat today. Today, we're going to be talking to Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. about the five levels of attachment. So fasten your seatbelt because we're going to learn and grow together. Okay, Miguel, it's time to dance. The Lillian McDermott Show. We love, we fear. Bridges we burn. We make mistakes. Then we live and learn. When life gets tough. And it seems like your best ain't good enough. If you're in need of hope, you know where I'll be. I'll be right here. Right here, and when you need a friend, you can count on me. I'll be right here, right here, waiting for you. This is the place you can always turn to when you need a friend. The Lillian McDermott Show. To reach out to Lillian, visit her on the web at whenyouneedafriend.com. Now let's all learn together. Here's Lillian McDermott. Hello, my listening and viewing friend. It's so nice we can meet each other on the air on this beautiful best day ever. And for those of you who are tuning into the classroom for the first time, please know I've been waiting for you. This is a safe place where you can go to when you need a friend. It is my commitment to provide alternative ways to heal. And it is my mission to make awareness, responsibility, and truth a part of our everyday life. And I hope you, my listening, as well as my viewing friend, will feel empowered to embrace inner truth and live the life of your dreams. Now, as you know, I have quoted the four agreements numerous times, and I'm sure that Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. has heard this a bajillion times, but I want uh, the, the four agreements is a wonderful tool. And I want to talk a little bit about that because we go beyond the four agreements to the five levels of attachment with Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. Can you imagine? Can you imagine growing up, knowing this information, going through your, your life, going through the um, rebelling as children and then coming back to new truths, the new truth, the same truth that your parents were telling you about. So the five levels of attachment are different ways that once you get the veil taken off your eyes, you're able to see your true authentic self. And today we have Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. It's been a while since he's been in the classroom and I'm so excited that he's here today because it's our sole purpose in life to give and receive love and knowledge. And I'm excited that he's here today to share a little bit more about how we can get to know our genuine self. Thank you so much, Miguel, for coming into the classroom today. Hi, Lillian. Good morning. How are you? Thanks for I'm... having me on the program once again. It's yes. good to be back here. And I can't believe I, 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 I'm remembering the song uh, right here waiting for you. That's every right. You I serenade me every song. time. Go ahead. Yeah. You want to serenade me again? <laughs> wherever you come, wherever you do, I'll be here right here waiting for you. <laughs> Marks. Yes, I remember. We, every, every time you come on, I love being serenaded by Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. This is fabulous. So before we get started, um, I really do want to... Um, go back to basics because we, we have a new audience. Our, our audience is growing every time. So they may have not known you or your dad. So I just thought, let's start from the very beginning. What is Toltec? And then let's move on to, you know, give us a little bit about your background and, then, and how it involves the Toltec tradition and what it is. Well, the word Toltec is a Nahuatl word. Nahuatl being a Mesoamerican language that uh, if I translate it in English, it means artists. If I translate the phrase, the Toltec art of transformation into 100% English, it means the artist path of transformation. I am an artist and the canvas for my work of art is my life. Now that's the philosophy of the family. Uh, as a civilization, the Toltec ceased to exist over 500 years ago, uh, either with the expansion of the Aztec or Spanish empire. And uh, at that moment, it became an oral tradition uh, that where families across Mesoamerica, what we know as Mexico, uh, began to teach it in their own unique way. You know, some families in Mexico teach it as it was over 500 years ago, 
And then there's families like mine that adapts it with each generation. Uh, to paraphrase my grandmother, Sarita, if you practice the Totec tradition the way I practice it or your father practice it, you're killing the tradition. You have to practice it in your own unique way, which means that you put it into practice and life will teach you from the consequences of your choices, all the lessons you will have, which means that the lessons will adapt to your life experience. So for my family, we come from a long line of people who do their very best to help people. You know, from my great grandfather, Don Ezequiel, his son, Don Leonardo, my grandmother, uh, Mare Sarita, who's Don Leonardo's daughter, my father, Don Miguel Ruiz, and now my brother and I, we teach the very best we can with what we have. And what we have is life experience, uh, an ancestry that gives us all these instruments that allows us to heal from the wounds of conditional love uh, left in our hearts. And it gives us the tools that allows us to engage our present moment. So from that point of view, this is what I do. This is what we share. So for us, the Totec tradition is an instrument of healing, not just of in, um, awakening and but it's, it's, it's a way that allows me to give me the opportunity to heal things in my life that impact me in a negative way, especially conditional love. So for me, the, the whole point of all this work is to unlearn my domestication, my conditioning, and, and live a life that, I, that is unique to me, to my experience, to get to know myself through the experience of being me. Yeah. And, you know, you use the word domestication. I understand what that word means. We've talked about it many times. Let's go back to the very beginning, because this is what you learned how not to be domesticated and um, and the, the four agreements with um, with your dad. So let's let's go over them really quickly so that when people understand when you go back to these words, they'll understand where you're coming from. So the main problem that the, the, our Tulsa tradition, the four agreements and every single book in our tradition de deals with is domestication. Domestication is a system of reward and punishment by which we model the behavior of an individual. Or if we live up to an expectation, we're worthy of a reward. And since we are emotional beings who experience the full spectrum of our emotions, that reward feels like acceptance, which feels like love. And when we don't live up to the expectation, it feels like rejection and the lack the rough of love is the way we've learned conditional love. I love if I live up to an expectation. I love myself if I reach up to the image of Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. who, if I live up to the four agreements, I'm worthy of love. But if I fall short of that, then I'm worthy of the punishment. And at that moment, I'm corrupting the tradition and using it as an instrument of domestication where in order to be worthy of love, I have to be the perfect version of myself or at least that I have to live up to the four agreements. And if I fall short, I reject myself. I punish myself. I, I go into a, a diatribe of judgment that says that I am not worthy of love. I'm not worthy of this because I didn't live up to expectation. And a telltale sign that we use the four agreements as an instrument of domestication is judging ourselves for taking things personal, judging ourselves for making assumptions, judging ourselves for not being impeccable with the word and judging ourselves for not doing our best. If you've done it, welcome to the club where we've used the four agreements and turned them into the four conditions of our personal freedom. And some people think that we're practicing the four agreements, but what we really are doing, we're practicing the four conditions when with domestication and the reason why is because we're so used to domestication that we will corrupt all of it. So for us in being aware that I'm doing that, you know, being aware that I'm using my word in this way, which is in this case, not being impactful with the word because I'm using my word to reinforce conditioned beliefs, domesticated beliefs mm -hmm. that makes me one, not accept myself for who I am at this very moment, but it makes me pretend to be something I am not. And from this point of view, Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. doesn't exist. It is simply the model by which I domesticate myself. And the person who does exist, to see myself with unconditional love, is the willingness to see the whole of who I am and the living being that is me. That is the truth. Regardless of symbol or identity, I am this living being. So for, for us, in essence, that's the work that we do to unlearn all the conditioned beliefs to unlearn anything that keeps us from our healing and not giving ourselves permission to heal 
and be able to accept this person that I am at this very moment in time. Yeah. And, and you know, it's, it's, I, I love, I remember reading the four agreements and, and it was life changing. And so I'm reading the book, but you were living it with your dad. Um, how, how did you, uh, how does one um, learn this without being domesticated to be conditional or unconditional? Well, that's the thing, you know, like uh, to put it this way, when my son was born, you know, you can probably hear him in the background here, he has autism and all that. Um, my son, my father delivered my son Mm. And uh, he gave, he uh, gave him to my my wife and me, and he congratulated us on having a newborn baby boy. Then he turned to me and says, "Miguel, congratulations, you have a son. Now domesticate him." I'm like, "What? Yes, domesticate him. If you don't, someone else will, and you're not gonna like it." Mm-hmm. The author of the Four Agreements is asking me to domesticate his grandson. And remember, he remember, he said, if you don't, someone else will, which means we live in a world where domestication rules that where it exists. Mm-hmm. So I spent many years trying to figure out how to raise a child without domestication. And the answer is that it's impossible. And the reason why is because life teaches us through action reaction for every action, there's a reaction. That's the way life teaches us. But domestication, the way I just described it is the corruption of that where we use love as the motivator to create something. If you want to live up to the family name, if you want to live up to my love, to my expectation, you'll do all the, the all these things and then you'll be worthy of love. Mm-hmm. So from that point of view, we've corrupted that system by which life teaches us. Yeah. Life yeah. teaches us through our actions and the consequence. So, mind you, a consequence is not a punishment. A consequence is the r- direct result of an action. Mm -hmm. neither good nor bad nor right or wrong so some consequences are a success you know when we get things right we learn our lesson and some consequences are a mistake or where we didn't go as we planned it didn't work out this way we we tried this we tried it at that moment when we have the mistake we're used to being punished for it you know you you, we start judging ourselves for not being smart for not being this not being that and because we want to be the kid that gets the straight a's that gets it all right because if you're a straight A student, you're worthy of love. And that's, you can see, also see domestication corrupting that form of education, which is mm-hmm. the sharing of one, one generation with another, the knowledge we've learned. We send our kids to school to catch up to humanity. But sometimes we, corru- we confuse education with domestication because uh, we use domestication as that system we try to motivate our kids for. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's wonderful, wonderful that you can see it from a, a, a further away and then also closer, further away as your father was domesticating you in the way that uh, before the world domesticated you and mm-hmm. you're domesticating your children before the world domesticates them with new truths, with a different way, a different perspective. I know that I, I, I don't know if, if you told me this story on the air or off the air about the time you and your father went on a talk and um, he wore his pajamas to, uh, would you like to share that story to help people understand how we ourselves have our own preconceived notions of what life should be? Well, the way my father taught me that I take things personal, the, my, the way my father teaches now, like, for example, here's the thing, being the eldest son, uh, I got to witness my father's transformation from being Dr. Miguel Ruiz, Apprentice Miguel Ruiz, and Don Miguel Ruiz. I, I remember all three stages. Don Miguel, Dr. Miguel Ruiz was defin, definitely a disciplinarian who respected those straight A's and domesticated. Apprentice Don Miguel Ruiz was starting to shift a little bit. He's still, there still was some part of that domestication, but there was a little part of like, give him the chance to figure out himself. And Don Miguel Ruiz, the way he taught is, let him experience the consequences of their choices, which means he sets up situations where we can learn from the consequences. So in this case, my father and I were doing a presentation in Rochester, New York, and our host puts us up in a place where it was very nice. They had a nice restaurant and people are dressed nice and all that. So 
we finished our presentation and you know we're underneath the lights and all that kind of thing and we go back to the hotel and my father sees that the restaurant is full with people and he says hey let's go and eat now, i look at, over at the restaurant and it's full of people dressed very nicely some people men and wearing suit and ties women are dressed elegantly and i look at ourselves and we're not so fresh and after being in the in the underneath the light sometimes we're not so fresh so i told my dad hey pop let's go upstairs and freshen up and make ourselves presentable to come down to eat and my dad just looks at me and goes okay <laughs> so we go upstairs i i take a quick shower and I started look, dressing up and I look good, you know, from my point of view. I go downstairs, wait, and my dad's still not there. So I wait for him, wait for him. And then I look around and people are dressed nice. I'm dressed nice. I fit in. Feels good. Yes. And then all of a sudden, the door opens to the elevator. And out comes my dad dressed in his pajamas, <laughs> wearing slippers. And I'm going, oh, no, oh, no. My dad's going to try to teach me something. Not gonna, and I start doing my own little mantra. I'm not gonna bite. Not gonna bite. Not gonna bite. Not gonna <laughs> bite. The guy walks up to me and says, "Miguel, is everything okay?" And I said, "Yep." <laughs> Are you sure? Yep. Okay. So he walks towards the restaurants, and I'm walking behind him, embarrassed, like a teenager once again. My father does a great job <laughs> of making me feel embarrassed. I'm this is, nine, this is 2009, so I'm 33 years old, something like that. <laughs> And he's still making me feel like I'm 15 or 13. You know, it, it was pretty good. <laughs> we, got, we get to the restaurant. There's no uh, dress code. People are dressed nice because they want to dress nice. So when the hostess comes up and asks us for a table for three, we said, yes, no problem. She said, walk this way. So she walks us down the middle of the restaurant. And since <laughs> I'm walking behind, I can see all the heads turning to see my father and I can hear them whispering, oh my God, look, can you see whispering? Can you imagine and all that kind of things? So I'm starting to feel like very self-conscious, very self-aware, and I am turning into a statue of salt. And once I, you know, we get to the, to the booth and the hostess leaves us, my dad turns around again and says, is everything okay? And I said, yep. Are you sure? Yep. So we sit down. My dad then grabs the menu and starts like gesturing, kind of like trying to see because he did he forgot his reading glasses. So he puts his fingers to like he he does this thing where he puts his index index finger and thumb together and goes back and forth between his eye, trying to create a, a depth of field that makes him be able to see, you know, to read. At that point, uh, someone gives my dad uh, his uh, their reading glasses. My dad puts them on, and they're the wrong prescription. So his eyes kind of do something funny, and I go, "Ugh!" My whatever poker face I had about keeping it in, my poker face just went away, and my I rolled my eyes like a teenager would with embarrassment. <laughs> and my father pounced. What's wrong? And I said, Papa, come on, this is this is a nice restaurant. People are dressed nice here. And here you are dressed like this, like uh, like Howard Hughes or something, like an eccentric. <laughs> and Papa, it, it's embarrassing. My dad looks at me and says, do you disrespect me so much that you think you have to pay for my consequences yourself, that you assume responsibility for my actions and you are paying my consequences. Do you disrespect me so much that you don't think that I can pay it for myself? And then when he said that, I'm going, it's the truth, yes. I was disrespecting my father because I was paying for his actions myself. Part of my domestication growing up was birds of a feather fly together. I tell you who you are by who you hang out with, mm -hmm. things like that. But the big one, my mom, would whenever I was throwing a tantrum, you know, uh, or behaving, you know, in a way that was, you know, just screaming and yelling, whatever, trying to get my way. My mom would say, is, you gotta look over there. You see that boy? You see that boy over there? He's looking at you. Don't you feel embarrassed? Don't you feel ashamed? Don't you feel guilt? Oh. Don't you don't you? What is he going to say? What is going to think about you? Don't you worry about that? Pay attention. And I tell you, it worked. 
because all of a sudden I'm like, I'm looking at other people. I'm like, ah, what are they going to think about me? I should do this. I should like, and it's, it was her way to get me to behave in a public setting as in the middle of a tantrum. And as a parent myself, I totally understand this. And you know, any, any parent will relate to this mm -hmm. and will be tempted by this one, but it worked, but it had that impact because now embarrassment was a punishment and and the consequence that i didn't want to feel so mm -hmm. you better not make me feel embarrassed because if i'm embarrassed then i'm bad and i'm not living up to the expectation and i reject myself and i start doing it to anyone else father brother you are part of the total tradition you don't make me look bad son daughter don't make me look and that, that kind of thing you can see how it percolates and and, and begins to spread throughout other relationships. You're Huge. near me, don't make me look bad. So it's a trigger. My father exposed a trigger for me to how I domesticate myself with embarrassment, with with being self-conscious, with being this thing that doesn't allow me to see myself. Mm -hmm. So I, I looked at myself and I said, yes, father, I, I forgive me. I was being disrespectful to you. It's the way my father taught me that I take things personal. He exposed a trigger that made me domesticate other people in order for them to fit the image I want them to fit okay. so that I don't feel embarrassment, that punishment. So this is the way my father teach, taught us how not to take things personal. Mm -hmm. he, he set up a situation where there was nowhere to hide yeah. but to see that I take this personal and it comes out in this way. To me, not taking things personal simply means not assuming responsibility for someone else's will or perception. I only control to the tips of my fingers. I control my own life. I control my own will, my own perception. I'm responsible for the integrity and clarity of what I say, but I'm not responsible for how people interpret those words. I'm not responsible for how other people live their life. I'm not responsible for their perception. They are. And to respect them is to respect their free will, their perception. And I do not assume responsibility for that. So you can say that taking things personally is assuming someone else's will or perception and projecting myself onto their actions. And that's the trigger that makes me domesticate them. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you have written many books. I mean, your dad has written books and you have written many books and you're a standalone on it as it is. And so here you are um, knowing this, these truths. And now what caused you to talk about attachments and what caused you to write about the book? And let's talk about attachment, what that means to you and how you one upped the four agreements. <laughs> stuck well, it in the eye, stuck them in the eye. <laughs> Well, an attachment is investing yourself emotionally and physically or intellectually onto something that's not a part of you. Is as you, 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 you're trying to engage a moment. Now, mind you, an attachment is something good. It's a healthy thing to engage a moment, to attach ourselves to a moment. What makes it unhealthy is when we reach that moment to let go and we can't. That's what, that's what uh, makes an attachment unhealthy. It's that I can't let go. Who am I without this? Who am I without this belief? Who am I without this moment? I need to attach myself to this. And that's what makes an attachment unhealthy. Mm -hmm. So when I was growing up, people would always try to teach me about detach, detach, detach from what? I didn't understand. So my grandmother, during my apprenticeship with her, always had this question. Do you control knowledge or does knowledge control you? Mm -hmm. Now, when I was 14 years old, I had no idea what that meant. But as I grew older, I began to understand it. And it was through the levels of attachment. When my grandmother Sarita taught me what attachment is, she didn't use the levels of attachment. She just basically described Dante's Inferno. The more attached we are, the more in hell we are in. So... She taught me about that. Do you control knowledge or does knowledge control you? Well, the first time I saw that attachment, you know, in the, in the way she described it, you know, Dante's Inferno or hell, 
I went to a soccer uh, game. And in the soccer game, you know, I was, it was between uh, Mexico versus something else, someone else, I don't, I don't remember who, but mm -hmm. I was in a section where people were dressed in Guadalajara uh, colors, you know, because my family's from Guadalajara. You know, my father played for Pumas, so we also like Pumas, but uh, Guadalajara has a team called Chivas that is uh, red, white, and blue um, because of the, of the French connection. So we sat in there and the arch nemesis to Chivas is the team from Mexico City, which is Club America and their jersey is uh, yellow. Um, um, little, like, uh, what's the name of the little, uh, little bird, Tweety Bird, uh, the, the little yellow. Canary. Uh, canary, thank you okay. so much. The canary yellow. Yeah. So we were in an area surrounded by all these Chiba fans and this guy and his girlfriend walk up and he is wearing that canary yellow uh, jersey. All he did was walk into the seat with his girlfriend and he had that shirt on. And all of a sudden, all these people around me begin to yell at him, up, sound obscene, try to confront him. He would try to return, you know, try to defend himself a little bit. And then eventually someone just leaned over and began to hit him oh, and they got wow. into a fight. The thing is, the guy did nothing. He did nothing. All these people saw was the canary yellow. And it's kind of like the red, red to a bull. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it, it triggered them. And he in return saw their red, the, uh, the red striped, uh, white, red and white striped jersey. And he in return returned it. They weren't seeing their humanity. They weren't seeing each other's humanity. All they saw that was the personification of an idea that blinded them to their humanity, but made them realize that there were enemies and to such degree that they would hurt each other that way. Mm -hmm. it's it was my first encounter with fanaticism in a very dramatic way. And I saw my grandmother's teachings. In this case, the answer to my grandmother's question is knowledge has complete and total control of my will, where not only will I no longer see myself, knowledge tells me who to love, who to reject, who to accept, who to hurt because I am not seeing a human being. I'm seeing the personification of an idea, a symbol that I either agree with or disagree with. Mm -hmm. And even if you do, I do agree with it, you better live up to that image. And that's level five fanaticism. Mm -hmm. And I turn around and I start seeing it in different aspects. And I was able to answer my grandmother's question in a totally different way. That was level five. I recognize attachment at level five, which is fanaticism. Level four, internalization. You can say that's when I use the four conditions, for example. You know, before I even wrote a book, people used to ask me, which one of the four agreements is the hardest one for you to practice? And I always answered taking things personal, as the story I just shared with you, or yeah, being impeccable yeah. with the word. And it dawned on me eventually that the reason why these two agreements are the hardest one for me to practice is because I was pretending to be a man who was impeccable with his word and didn't take things personal. I was pretending to be something I'm not. And it's when I became aware of the four conditions is when I became aware of how I corrupted the Totec tradition in my own unique way. And I wasn't the only one. I realized that, that you know, if you ever judge yourself for taking things personal or making an assumption, all that kind of thing, then that's when we realize we're using the four conditions and not practicing the four agreements. So it's when I begin to domesticate myself with this image. So that's level four and five. The, the way I domesticate myself and at level four, it gives me the rules by which I live my life. That's the answer to my grandmother's question. Mm -hmm. But at level five, it, it basically has complete and total control of me. I am the personification of an idea. In this case, I am Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. as opposed to the human being, it's an identity, mm -hmm. an identity that I have to constantly live up to. That's fanaticism. Yeah, and no one who has a difference of opinion is allowed to come near you. Yeah, exactly, yeah. or I reject it or whatever, and that's the thing. So the work that we do is to that go of it, you know, once I become aware of that domestication, well, how do I practice the four agreements? Well, 
I accept that I take things personal. It's kind of like going to AA meeting, hello, my name is so-and-so and I'm alcoholic or I'm a drug addict. Hello, my name is Don Miguel Reese Jr. And I do take things personal. I do make assumptions. Sometimes I'm not impeccable with the word and sometimes I don't do my best. Just ask my wife, she is my witness. <laughs> it's the moment where I stop pretending to be something I am not and I accept myself. You can say that's the moment where we begin to crack our domestication. Mm -hmm. And that's when the four agreements become an instrument. It's a mm -hmm. choice. Mm -hmm. I accept that I take things personal, but I've read a book about how not to take it personal, which simply means I do not assume responsibility for someone else's will. And I begin to look for triggers that make me take things personal. Mm -hmm. And once I recognize those triggers, when they come up and that situation comes up, I have a choice. If I take it personal, it's because I want to take it personal. I've accepted that but I also know how not to take it personal because I read the concept, I read the book, I accept it and see how that begins my life. And I'm free to choose between the two. That's what personal freedom is. I'm free to say yes to either one. And with that awareness, I say yes to not taking it personal because I know that if I do take it personal, it comes with a hangover I don't want to experience and it makes it easy for me to say no to it. Mm -hmm. And that's when we use the the four agreements as an instrument of transformation. Mm -hmm. It reminds me that I have the choice, but I'm the one making the choice. Yes, yes. And so that's level five and four. And so level three is identity. Mm -hmm. okay. So okay. for me, the answer to my grandma's question on identity is knowledge and I are one. To understand this one is actually better if I start at level one for this okay. one. Okay, let's do Level one, the authentic self. Let's say that, let's call a lotus flower. Let's use, let's use the image of a lotus flower that we call awareness. A level one, that lotus flower is completely open, which means I can go in any direction in life. The answer to my grandmother's question is, I am aware that I'm alive, regardless of what I think, regardless of what I know. I'm aware that I'm alive and I'm that infinite possibility that can go in any direction in life. I'm aware I am life. That's level one. Level two, preference. Because I can go in any direction in life, the direction I want to go, go to, which is the direction I'm going to say yes to, that's my preference. So you can say, imagine a flower that engages a moment. It closes as it engages that moment. And when that moment is over, it opens up again. Engage, disengage. The flower opens and closes. It closes as it engages a moment and it opens up as it detaches because that which it engages is not a part of who he or she is, is just a moment in time that we're present. For example, right now I'm engaging you. Mm -hmm. When this is over, I disengage and I engage being a father, which I'm still doing, of course. <laughs> so I am engaging a moment and I'm disengaging. So preference, the answer to my grandmother's question is, I'm aware of, the, of that I am the authentic self and I will use knowledge as an instrument that will inform my choices, but I'm the one making the choice, mm -hmm. which means I'm saying yes to this path. Level three, identity. Imagine, engage a, mo a moment, and when that moment is over, I don't detach. Imagine that lotus flower not opening up. As you become aware, the best way to attach yourself to a moment that no longer is here is to make it a part of who I am. And the way to do that is to identify myself with my preference. I now give myself, for example, if I read the book, The, Tol the Four Agreements, I call myself a Toltec at level three. At level two, I wouldn't call myself a Toltec. I'm just reading a book. When I stop reading the book, I'm also not calling myself a Toltec. I'm willing to engage anyone in life. I can talk to someone who reads Deepak Chopra, who uh, follows Jesus, Mohammed, uh, Moses, and all these beautiful traditions that surrounds the world. It, it, we all look for that divinity. At level three, we begin to identify ourselves and we still can interact with one another, but we just have an identity because now who I am, what I am is colored by my preference. So that's level three. As we go up level four, then I start using my identity as the model by which I domesticate myself. In this case, Toltec, I can use the Toltec tradition to domesticate myself. 
And I can do the same thing with Deepak Chopra, with Miriam Williamson, Jesus, Buddha, Siddhartha, Muhammad, psychology, psychology, Alcoholics Anonymous. I can use all those beautiful traditions that teach us about unconditional love, but we're so attached to our domestication that I will corrupt all of them in the same way I corrupted the four agreements and turn them into the four conditions, which leads us to fanaticism. Mm -hmm. So identity is a beautiful thing. It's a symbol. It's a symbol that represents my preference. I can use it as the a way to honor my ancestors, to honor where I come from. It's a beautiful thing. And at level three, that's what it, it represents. Mind and I am, I think therefore I am, knowledge and I are one. Mm -hmm. I am my mask. And at, the mo at this moment, my authentic self is given a symbol uh, uh, in the color of the preference I wanna go in life. And that's why I say it's also a slippery slope because once I have that identity, once I have that image, the temptation to domesticate myself is there because I'm surrounded by other people who do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. So let's take that through. Let's, let's say, how do you detach then um, as a level, when you're your authentic self? Um, as, as an authentic self, you do you identify with what you think and who you are? Um, let's separate them as an authentic self. I am who I am and I love who I love. How do you, how do you know where you're at in the attachment level? Well, let's put it this way. Let's, let's use the analogy of, so, uh, of soccer. I started with soccer. I'll, I'll continue with soccer. Okay. At level five, <laughs> at level one, you know, you, you can go to any game in the world. It doesn't have to be, it could be a beautiful stadium it could be a dirt field you see a game you decide to engage it which is you sit and you watch it and you have fun and you enjoy it when the referee blows his or her whistle to end the game you stand up and you go on your life it does like you engage that game for those 90 minutes and you had fun but when it was over you stood up and you continued on with life doesn't matter who won who lost you enjoyed that moment mm -hmm. because you know there's a a clear line between the stands and the field that you know that what happened on the field has nothing to do with you but you still enjoyed the movement and the effort that mm -hmm. is happening there mm -hmm. level two you realize that if you invest yourself a bit more you will enjoy this game so you look at other team and you look for your favorite color you look for a name like oh this there's a player in that team that has his name Ruiz I'm gonna root for that team or uh, Mac and Mort. I, I can enjoy that, you know, okay, I'll take that team. You know, I invest a little of myself to root for this team. Doesn't mean I'm gonna root against the other one. I'm just saying, I, I would like for this team to win. Mm -hmm. And true enough, once you have that little investment, the game has higher, it's like a roller coaster. You know, the, all of a sudden the, the highs and lows are a lot more enjoyable when the team is winning, yay! When the team is losing, erg, and you, okay. you engage it. But when the referee blows his or her whistle to end the game, you withdraw that investment because ultimately you know that that player is not you or your family and the colors are just the colors because you're still very much aware of that line that separates the stance and the field. Mm -hmm. And you go on your life at the end of the 90 minutes and what happened in those 90 minutes has nothing to do with what's happening next in life. Mm -hmm. You're engaging that next moment in time. Level three, identity. That line between the stands and the field begins to blur. You do the same thing you did with uh, identifying yourself, someone with uh, your last name on the team, someone, you, uh, the neighborhood you're from or the city you're from or the colors. You invest yourself a bit more. In fact, you even buy a jersey of that team. <laughs> now, when the referee blows his or her whistle to end the game, if the team won, you're happy for the rest of the week. The result impacted your life. If they lost, that also impacted your life. Now you're like, oh, we lost, can't believe that. You walk, you get up and you have the team colors. Let's go. Hello, Miguel. Now you identify yourself with the team. You identify yourself with the colors. At level three, you know, you, you stand up, the referee blows his or her whistle to end the game. And this team is now a part of who you are. 
you know, you, you kind of project yourself onto what's happening on the field with a victory or the loss. Mm -hmm. But it now begins to color your life outside of that game. At level four, internalization, that line between the, the field and the stands is really blurred. You can't tell the difference. If your team won, you won. If your team lost, you lost. If the good player plays good, that means like, hey, I, I support the good player. It's, 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 it's victory by association. If the player plays terrible, what an embarrassment. You let us down, all kind of thing. It's like, so you start, it doesn't matter whether the referee blows his or her whistle, you're already impacted by the game. It's, it's in, impact your life before the game, during the game, and after the game. Now, here's the thing. At level one, two, and three, if you are around a supporter of the other team, you can still get along with them. Hey, you like soccer? I like soccer. Let's let's talk about soccer, man. I can see how your team, your congratulations, your team is really good, and you you, you commend them. You, you it's enjoyable. It's an icebreaker. That's the beautiful thing about about an identity. It can be the icebreaker that allows us to create a relationship. Mm -hmm. But at level four internalization, that is not happening. I am not buying you a beer. I am not going to engage you. In fact, I'm going to tell you why your team is terrible and why mine is so much better than yours, even. If your team won, your team is terrible. You know, you bought the referee. I'm not going to accept that result, you know? And, and, and now I, the team dictates who I am friends with and who I am not. It's kind of like the Yankees and the Red Sox, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. there's no way I'm getting along with a Yankees fan or if I'm married to one, then, you know, then, you know, how's the divided civil war, you know, that kind of thing. So you you have that impact it, it it begins to impact your life outside of those 90 minutes level five fanaticism there's absolutely no separation between the stands and you and the field you know it's uh, it's you lead these colors uh, they're your life if they win great if they lose you won't accept the 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 the, the defeat you know it's yeah, always yeah some some conspiracy some something and there's no way i'm getting along with those people that wear those colors you know the canary canary jersey i'm definitely there i'm willing to kill and i'm willing to die for my colors because these symbols this this colors are more important than my life mm -hmm. and that's when we lose sight of our humanity you can say that's when that level of fanaticism gets so attached or impacts my life that my life is not as important as this jersey, this color, this logo, this crest on my chest when I wear the jersey. Yes. It's more important than my life. And at that moment, when you kill or harm someone who has the other co color, you're not killing a human being. You're, you're, you're doing that damage, that, that violence against the personification of an idea that you agree with or disagree with. Amazing. Amazing how the mind works when it's clouded like that. Before I ask you, how do we get out of this? I want to acknowledge, I want to acknowledge you. I want to acknowledge the fact that you can learn more with Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. You can go to Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. com and uh, learn more about the five levels of attachment. You can also, there's lots of beautiful books that he's written and we've done many classes together and every time he serenades me. And so you can go back to some of those um, uh, views uh, of the uh, videos that we've done. Also, you can go to his website and check out everything that he does. But I also want you to, uh, I wanna ask you to go to whenyouneedafriend.com. Please, please subscribe and also subscribe to my channels of you know all my uh, social media like and follow and also check out while you're there my sponsors which without my sponsors there'd be no class they'd be and so figure out ways to su uh, support my sponsors as they are supporting the class also you know and i keep saying also because we've grown so much in the last year I want to encourage you to get the Book of Revelation Bible Study with Dr. Lorraine Day. This is 12 weeks. You can get the DVD or online, which is a lot cheaper. And also the 100 uh, plus lessons from the Exodus. And, um, and you can 
on September 17th, 18, 19, 2021, uh, or so I say 2021. So 17, 18, 19, 2021 is my I Am The Solution workshop. So please consider some of those. That's the way you can support the classroom. And last but not least, you can become an enrolled student, whether you donate a dollar or a thousand dollars. We are now really occupying or, or asking for help and donations because that's how we are staying afloat. So thank you so much for your generosity. And as I mentioned, Miguel Ruiz Jr. is the website. Oh, so MiguelRuizJr.com. So I, I want to encourage you to learn about this, but you know, here we are. I don't know where you identify, for those of you who are listening, <clears throat> excuse me, with the attachment levels. So I know that in the book you have the smoking mirror and, uh, and, and creating awareness. So how does someone go from, you know, level five to level one or level two, you know, yeah, so if you yeah. can, because it's all about being a solution here. Yeah. Well, mm. the first thing is uh, being aware, you know, like to me, these levels of attachments is an instrument that allow me to know where I am at. You know, yeah. like once I recognize the pattern, the behavior, like the need to domesticate someone that you can see I'm a level four. If I'm being like really irrational with, with anger or whatever, I could be my fanaticism. Uh, I'm, if I'm a level one, you know, it's like, all right, I, I can identify myself and relate to other people, even if they don't agree with what I'm doing, you know, that, you know, or, or I don't agree with them, which, but it doesn't affect affect our relationship, then I know I'm at level three. At level two, I don't have a need to identify myself with my preference. I know I'm my individual self. I'm who I am, regardless of what I think or what I know or belief system. That's, you know, ability. So we're all in different stages. So to go to use it as an instrument of transformation is to become aware. This is where I'm at. At that moment, we have a choice to let go or not. So you have a moment of clarity, you have a moment of clarity without any action is just a thought that passes in the wind. But a moment of clarity followed by action becomes a pivotal moment in our life. I love that quote. Moment where we see where I'm at and you have a choice. It's like an alcoholic or drug addict that one day wake up and see the consequences of all their action and they have a blistering headache, a blistering hangover. At that moment, they have a choice. It's like an alcoholic or drug addict that, you know, you wake up and see the consequences of what you've created and you have a choice. You can either do the hair of the dog, which is to have another drink and the hangover will go away. But in that moment of clarity and you see what your life has become or you, what you've created, at that moment you have a choice to follow that hair of the dog that will take away the, the hangover and just punt and continue the cycle or you change direction and you decide to heal and you go through the detox, you go through all the process, you go through the steps and you find healing or you find that clarity in your life. So in our life, we can say from fanaticism, the ability to let go is to ability to recognize there and the fifth agreement, be skeptical, but learn to listen. Mm -hmm. To be skeptical is to hold back your yes and hold back your no and listen, if you listen, you're able to read, to give scrutiny to that what you perceive. If it survives your scrutiny, then you'll say yes. If it doesn't survive your scrutiny, then you say no, but here's the thing, in holding back your yes and holding back your no, you're breaking the cycle of the automatic yes and the automatic no in your life. And that right there is a very important thing. And doubt, at this moment, you're using it as an instrument for transformation. You're putting doubt to your beliefs. If it survives your scrutiny, then you'll, you'll say yes. If it doesn't survive your scrutiny, then you'll say no. And that's the best way to let go. In the Toltec tradition, there's nothing to learn but to unlearn. So that's how we let go, go from fanaticism to internalization, level five to level four. Now, mind you, it's a lot difficult than that, of course, mm -hmm. because it's a very solid, very rigorous. But if you ever find yourself in ability to question your belief system that gives you that minimum opportunity to continue that cycle or change it if you recognize that it's causing harm in your life, that's impacting your life in that way. To go from level four to level three is become aware of the four conditions. In this case, I'm using the four agreements as an instrument. Mm -hmm. 
as uh, and use it as the in, uh, instrument of transformation the, to practice the four agreements. Be, be impeccable with the word. Don't take things personal. Don't make assumptions. To me, these three agreements helps us clean the channels of communication. It allows us to let go of our conditioned beliefs and we engage and, we, and you can say we engage our healing and we, the best way to let go of conditional love is to forgive ourselves for ever saying yes to it in the first place. That's beautiful. In, in, let's go there, let's go there because self-forgiveness, because we are really good for the most part of tearing ourselves down of that conditional love of, of, uh, of, you know, the shame and the blame, that's not healthy shame or blame, you know, shame and shame is good for, you know, not doing it again. Like if you're, you feel a certain way, you, you, you decide, okay, uh, there's a consequence to my behavior and I, or, or you feel, you feel sorry for what you've done. And so there is a healthy um, consequence to that, but when it becomes um, self-damaging or self-sabotaging, let's go there as far as self-forgiveness and, and the steps for that. What would you say? Forgiveness, I'm gonna quote a teacher in Sacramento that taught me uh, this beautiful way of seeing forgiveness. Forgiveness is the moment you no longer wish the past was any different. Yes. It is the moment you accept it, and you let it go. To accept it, it simply means that you can't go back in the past and change a yes to a no or no to a yes because life no longer exists in the past because the past only exists in your mind, in your memory, just like the future only exists in our imagination with all the what ifs. So it's the moment you accept it happened. To let it go is the analogy my brother has of a scorpion that decides to no longer sting itself with its own tail administering the emotional poison that he meant for someone else to him or herself. Mm -hmm. It is the moment I will no longer hurt myself with the past. To me, that's what letting go is. I will no longer hurt myself with the past. I will let it go. You can say it's the moment where I give myself the permission, not just to heal, but to move on with life to learn from our past, to learn from those mistakes, but to let it go, to forgive myself for ever saying yes to conditional love in the first place. And now, as I'm the youngest I will ever be, how do I want to live the rest of my life? How do I want to engage? How do I want to manifest? The beautiful thing about that is that I get to answer that. Beautiful, beautiful. So I'm hoping that as you're listening to Don Miguel Ruiz Jr., you're identifying with where you're at when you, with your levels of attachment. And perhaps that awareness will help you and myself included, you know, shift that and make the decision and make that choice. And if somebody were to walk in right now, Miguel, and say, you know, what is this all about? I just joined the, the, the classroom and I really am not aware of, of what they're talking about. What would you say is the most important aspect of when it comes to the five levels of attachment and turning towards your authentic self? That they're instruments for healing. Emotionally, physically, it's, it's the thing that allows us to remove any barrier, anything holding us back any obstacle that stops us from giving ourselves a permission to heal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so I, I want to encourage all of you again, uh, Don Miguel Ruiz Jr.com. Are you going to be appearing anytime soon? Or what, what is your, because uh, uh, I was looking at your events, it looks like you're still really busy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this uh, fall seems to be um, picking up. Uh, I'm going to be in, in Denver. I'll be in, in Santee. I'm going to be in New York, Rhinebeck, Omega Institute, and and um, places like that. So just uh, visit our website, miguelruiz.com, and uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. You, know, yes. it, it, you never know how, how things will change or not, but at this very moment, that is the plan. 
Absolutely. Well, I am so grateful that you took the time to be here today I, and share your wisdom with us. Again, the book is called The Five Levels of Agreement, but that's not the only book. I mean, I have all these books listed. Have you, have you written one past, I think it was The Mastery of Self? The Which, Mastery of Self, The, five, uh, mm -hmm. the Seven Secrets to Happy, Healthy Relationships. That's right. We did a class on that one too. And the wisdom, we did the book on, uh, we did the book of wisdom, the little book of wisdom. That was fun. You, and I, I mean, book coming out in October called the mastery of life, the mastery of life. Wonderful. Maybe you can come back and we can uh, discuss your book again. Thank you so much, Miguel, for coming in today. And I know it's been a busy day for you. And um, so to, to model that unconditional love that you've shown me throughout this broadcast um, not only with the people that you, you teach but also your son so thank you so much for, oh, for, thank for you so much everything for that you do yes and i'm looking forward to getting the new book the new book the mastery of life and and maybe maybe someday i can get you and your dad to come on and your brother all three of you all the all the ruiz brothers and and father so thank you so much and please remember, we'll be right here waiting for you. Miguel had to go. We'll be right here waiting for you worldwide at whenyouneedafriend.com. This is Lillian McDermott and, of course, Don Miguel Ruiz Jr., who had to leave, wishing you love, peace, joy, and unexpected abundance. Make it the best day ever. The opinions and advice expressed on the Lillian McDermott Radio Show are intended for the individual callers and guests on the program and are presented to our wider audience solely for general educational purposes. Please act responsibly and consult personally with your own medical, psychological, or nutritional expert before taking any steps to improve your life. Thank you for watching, and we will see you soon. Bye.